Ah, the abusive histories that so many of us experienced have caused us to have challenges being positive, being happy, being upbeat in our lives. And as a result, that's one of the reasons I wanted to address this is that, you know, you can, you can teach somebody, as we talked about yesterday, you can teach somebody all these pithy little things about don't worry, be happy. But if they are naturally caught in this fight or flight mode because they were uh, abused as children or even as adults, that kind of stuff doesn't work, and it can actually be quite, quite rather irritating to people. They don't want to hear that. What they want to know is why they're feeling so sad, why they're feeling so broken, why they're feeling so depressed, and they want to know how to change it, how to fix it. And that's what we've been talking about. So like I said, and I just want to recap this, approximately one out of every two to one out of every four people, so let's split the difference, one out of every three people, were seriously, emotionally, physically, sexually, verbally abused as children. And I've been sharing very candidly some of my experiences as, as what I was going through, and also more importantly, what I'm doing to heal it. The concept of what I'm sharing with you, of first acknowledging it, I did that, feeling it, did that, letting it go, releasing it, did all of that as well. And I'm encouraging you to do it too, because one of the things we need to remember is that um, as Beverly Engel, this is the book we're using, The Emotionally Abusive Relationship, when you look at emotional having been abused, you really don't have a lot of choice when you get older. You're either going to abuse or you're going to be abused or both. One of the things that I've not really talked about is that it is not, excuse me, uncommon for people to abuse each other. Now it is, we, we have been talking a lot about this, about this idea of there being an abuser in the relationship and a person who is abused in let's say a romantic relationship. However, in many cases, one person will abuse the other and it will become a triggering cycle that just goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So we need to realize that that's a potentiality too, because then we don't feel like we're being abusive. We just feel like we're, we're responding in kind, or should I say unkind. When someone puts it out to us and we put it back, we don't feel like we're being abusive. I'm not saying that I do that or you do that. I'm just saying when one does that, then we feel like that what we are doing is just it's a justifiable reaction. And as we talked about yesterday, fear is the source of all reactions. Action comes from love, comes from healthy emotions. Fear is what triggers reactions. Last night, I sat down and I rewatched for probably the, I don't know, 10th time, the movie Joker. The one with Joaquin Phoenix that came out a few years ago. I've always been a big fan of the character, the Joker, when watching Batman. And of course, Cesar Romero played him when I was a kid. But back then, Batman, it was supposed to be campy. It was supposed to be silly. And it was. And then later, Batman became a bit more edgy. And the Joker, of course, became a bit more edgy. I don't know if you know this, but when Tim Burton did the original Batman with Michael Keaton, he convinced, who played the Joker? I, I just slipped out of my, Jack Nicholson. He convinced Jack Nicholson to play the Joker. And Nicholson said that he would only do it if he got a percentage of the gross of the movie. So Nicholson worked for about five weeks and continues to make money off that movie and made about a half a billion dollars at last counting somewhere around $600 million just for that five weeks worth of work. So nice work if you can get it. And then of course we had Heath Ledger, who was just amazing as the Joker, just breathtaking. And I thought it was one of the finest performances and that no one ever should try and do the Joker again. And then we get 
Joaquin Phoenix. Now, I'm not totally digressing here. I'm going to tie this all together for you. But I want you to think, if you know any of the Joker characters that I've talked to you about just now, we've got Cesar Romero, we've got um, Jack Nicholson, we've got, well, Jared Ito, but I've never seen him. Leto, I, Ito, I've never seen him. But we've got Heath Ledger, and then we've got Joaquin Phoenix. Cesar Romero, we never learned where he came from or why he was the way he was as the Joker. None of the Batman characters were explained in the 1960s shows. There was no such thing as an origin story. Heath Ledger never had an origin story. Neither did Jack Nicholson. But the Joker was the very first movie to give the character, the Joker, an origin story. Where did he come from? You may or may not know this, but the Joker is not actually considered an official DC comics movie. In other words, Batman, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The original Joker, it was allowed to be made with the idea that it was not really related to the Batman series. And when it was made, it was decided that the Joker, if you haven't seen it, I'm going to spoil it for you. You find out about 80% of the way through the movie that Arthur Fleck, who becomes the Joker played by Joaquin Phoenix was an abused child. He was an abused child. There's a lot of holes in his history and holes in his past. And as he starts to dig, he finds out that his mother, who he has a very unhealthy relationship with, was in a mental institution. And when he goes and gets her records, he finds out that he and has repressed the memories was a terribly abused child. They, they don't go into a great, great detail. They show a few pictures of like a boy with bruises on his back and his face. And then they comment that the boy, him, was found chained to a radiator. So isn't it interesting? The Joker is just this bad guy in all the other movies because we don't take the time to get to know who the Joker was. And one of the things we need to remember, as I've stated many, many times, and, and like this book, because it talks about this idea, is that abusers were first and foremost abused. And when you can begin to understand that, it becomes easier to forgive them. And then to approach things with less anger and less passion. So today we want to talk about this concept of watch out for it. There's a very sad truth about being an abused person. And I think you'll see it in the movie Joker. When a person is abused, it damages their self-esteem. It damages their relating to other people in society. They tend to walk around afraid or angry and either of which makes them defensive. Now, Nature does something when an animal is wounded, when an animal is probably not going to thrive. And that is basically other animals feel that very same energy and then they become far more likely to attack the person. It's interesting. An abused child is not someone who's probably going to go to school and the teachers and the kids and everything say, wow, that's a damaged, hurting person. No, that's a spaz, that's a geek, that's a weirdo, that's a fatty, that's a whatever. And the abuse just picks up again. And that's what makes it really, really difficult when you're trying to break this pattern of abuse in your own life because you feel like you deserve it. So you go out in life expecting the world to slap you down, treat you bad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you often walk out with a chip on your shoulder and that chip, people see it, even if it's not a literal chip. And then they come along and they try and knock it off. This, in my mind, is the really sad thing about a person who is abused as a child because they walk out into the world expecting it to continue and the world responds. Other people respond. They recognize that person's weakness. And it has nothing to do with that person's size. 
I sometimes wonder if maybe that was the reason I pounded on so much. <laughs> that was a that was a double entendre. Pounded on so much weight as a child. The reason I got up to almost 300 pounds is simply because I was afraid and I wanted a bigger size. I don't know. All I know is that the more we look for abuse, first of all, we need to be realize our patterns and see how we tend to treat to attract it. And one of the things I really like about this book, I keep wanting to hold up my phone because I'm reading it on my phone on my Kindle app, is that she gives you lots and lots and lots of exercises. I was sitting down doing some of them this morning and it takes a while. It takes time. Some of them make you cry and some of them make you angry. But you've got to realize your own pattern if you want to break out of it because you're just going to attract it. It is this weird thing about relationships. And, you know, I've been married and divorced three times. And I have read probably 20 books on relationships. I have written a best-selling book on <laughs> relationships. I've got a program on relationships. I created a, a, a gift item for couples uh, to keep their relationships. It's a, it's a game I created uh, back in my 30s. And yet with all of this, what I think couples need to know is that there is this unspoken vibration in the universe that seeks healing. Now stay with me. It seeks healing. So you're not healed. You're not whole. You're not healthy from your relationship with your parents. You then seek to attract someone with whom you can heal that relationship. A lot of times it's someone who acts like very much like one of your parents, but instead of trying to heal the relationship yourself, because the relationship you've got to heal is that one inside of you, we expect the other person to do it. And then the abuse starts from them or you begin to be abusive and then either person can be abusive and it can just continue. So this one comes down to that idea of the price of freedom is eternal vigilance, eternal vigilance, you know, and it's nothing more than like for me, I don't keep junk food and candy in the house. The other day I decided to make uh, something I had had at a restaurant called a Choco Cab and you take a wine glass and you melt some semi-sweet chocolate and then you dip just the, the lip of the wine glass in and then you let it dry. Uh, put it in the fridge is what I did. And then you put a little bit of uh, wine in there and you drink it. Oh, it's so good. You need to try it. Anyway, when I bought it, I realized that this thing is full of chocolate. And I started eating the chocolate and I went, whoa, it's better to go to waste than to go to waste. <laughs> it's better to go to waste than go to my waste. And so I got rid of it. So I'm saying that just like you're careful with your food choices and what you have around you because you're going to get triggered, be careful of people and learn that the triggers are ultimately yours. And the great blessing is either being triggered so that you get abused or being triggered so that you act abusive. Working through those triggers gives you power. It gives you strength. It gives you the capacity to live the life you want to live. And since I said, live the life that you want to live, please click share and type in the word share. Who's going to be the first one to share today? Any comments today? Everybody's continuing to give uh, congratulations to Ashley. There's my friend James. Good morning. Grateful for each day to try and be a better, more incredible me. I love that. Be a better you and give yourself a raise every day. That's how I like to look at life. Uh, Meemaw says, way to go, Ashley. Ashley's just saying thank you. Meemaw, first one to share. I love the fact that Meemaw, I love your name, Meemaw. We've talked about that before. Of course, Meemaw is a very Southern thing for grandma. And uh, you said they started calling you that young. And so you're not. Anyway, gl glad to see our friend here from Dubai. Anybody have any questions or comments? Otherwise, please click share. We're going to wrap this up tomorrow. Ingeborg, thank you so much for clicking share. I'd love to break our new record for sharing. We had like 48,000 people engage with my post last week. That is so awesome. Karen, grateful to all the jump starters, aren't we all? Linda Ann Stern says, yes, figuring out good food and people people in your life. Thanks for reminding. You know, ultimately, we're always responsible. And in other words, we are always able to respond. We choose our life. We choose our situations, not when we're kids. Unfortunately, that's thrust upon us. 
But then later on, we can choose to let it defeat us or we can choose to let it complete us. And that is up to us. We're going to wrap all this up tomorrow. That's my goal. Jennifer says, shared. Thank you so much for Jennifer. Anybody else going to click share before we say TTFN? And thanks, everybody, for being here. We look forward to it. Tomorrow, we're going to talk more about abuse, but I'm going to talk to you about how to know if you were raised in a dysfunctional family. And we're also going to talk about what to do about that. And later on in the week, I'm excited to talk to you about what we can learn from machines. Enjoy today. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye -bye. No more, no more complaining people, their lives are changing, we're flying high, creating a complaint free world. No more, no more complaining people, their lives are changing, we're flying high, creating a complaint free world. No more.